Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. My story happened almost 10 years ago. I live in a small house on the edge of the timber near Chalice, Washington. My little farmhouse has a very nice porch and I like to sit out there in the evenings and read and drink tea. I've done this for years. I'm a middle-aged school teacher. I have a big white dog I call Happy. I don't know what breed he is, but he's all white and has long hair. I suspect he's part Newfoundland, though he's not quite that big. Happy's name fits him. He's always wagging his tail and putting his head in your lap. I love that dog, and I worry because he's getting old. But how I came to have him is a story I won't tell anyone except under complete anonymity. It's just so unbelievable, but here goes. I didn't always have Happy. It's not like I got him as a pup or anything. One evening in the summer, I was sitting out on the porch when this big white dog came into the yard, then right up onto the porch wagging his tail. Of course it was Happy. And I petted him and tried to see if he had a collar with tags. No collar. I figured he was a stray, so I decided I'd give him something to eat, then figure out what to do. Maybe take him to the animal shelter if he stuck around and didn't go home. So I went into the kitchen and got him some leftover meatloaf. He seemed like he was really hungry, like a stray would be. He wasn't particularly skinny, so he hadn't been lost long. If he was lost and not just wandering around... I gave him plenty to eat, and he curled up by my feet and went to sleep. I kind of liked him from the very start, even though he stank to high heaven. I went back to my reading, and when I noticed some motion from the corner of my eye out at the edge of the forest, I figured it must be a deer. I watched, but didn't see anything. But Happy perked right up. He started wagging his tail and took off into the trees. Okay, I thought, he must be with someone, out exploring or something, or else he likes to chase deer. Maybe that's why he's lost. I'd hoped he'd now go on home, problem solved. I didn't think anything more about it. After a few days, the same thing happened. Happy showed up, very hungry. I was a bit put out at his owner for not feeding him, but I gave him some dinner. At the time, Happy spent the night I made him a bed out on the porch because he still stank. I began to wonder if my feeding him wasn't going to turn him into my dog, when he already had a home. I liked Happy, but I didn't particularly want a dog at the time. My previous dog had just recently died, and I was pretty distraught over it, and I just didn't want to go through all that again. A lot of people use this as an excuse to not get another dog, not that it's a very good one as there are lots of dogs needing homes. So this time, Happy stuck around for a few days, and I gave him a bath, then he again disappeared. This kept happening. Happy would show up, starving and smelly, hang around, then disappear. By then, I'd given him his name, and kind of resigned myself into having a part-time dog. I'd grown attached to him, and decided I would take him to the shelter if he ever did stick around, but keep him. He's just such a sweetheart. So, one particular time, Happy and I were out on the porch, and he'd been there for a few days. He was a gorgeous dog after I would bathe him and brush out his coat. Very pretty. Happy had been just laying around, but he suddenly got up and started wagging his tail. But this time, he stayed on the porch. He just stood there. I figured I knew what was up. The kid who owned Happy was back for his dog, and I wanted to talk to him about the situation. So I sat there and waited for him. Nothing. But Happy stood there, wagging his tail like he was glad to see the kid, but really wanted to stay with me. So I called out, Hey there, is this your dog? No sound or movement, but Happy was still wagging his tail. Now I could see someone over in the trees, but it didn't look like a kid at all. It looked like a grown man. This worried me a bit. I expected him to call out for the dog, but he just stood there. I called out again, but no answer. The longer the guy just stood there, the more uncomfortable I became. I went into the house, but Happy wouldn't come in, even though he was now a house dog. He just stood there wagging his tail. 
I watched out the window, and this thing stepped out of the trees and started walking towards the house. I can't describe my feelings, but it was total fight or flight reaction. I ran for my twenty two rifle. By the time I got my rifle, this creature was almost to the porch. I'll try to describe it. It was about five feet tall, with hair all over except on its face, where it had brown skin. It had broad shoulders, and its head seemed to come to a bit of a crest. It had no neck and massive shoulders. Its arms were long, and it had very muscular torso. Its face was almost human, with broad cheeks and a pushed-in nose. I was terrified, but Happy was still wagging his tail. It didn't occur to me until later that the creature meant the dog no harm. All I could think of was that he was coming after Happy, so I shot through the open door. I got it square on, and I shot it twice before it turned and ran, screaming. I'll never forget that scream. I was beside myself as I watched Happy run after this creature. I called to him, desperate, but he ignored me. What could I do? I ran after Happy, trying to catch him. I loved him, and I didn't want him to come to any harm. I still had my rifle, and I was torn between not wanting anything to happen to Happy and being scared to death and wanting to hide. I remember running as hard as I could through the thick foliage, getting whipped in the face by branches, stumbling but continuing on, until suddenly I came upon Happy and the creature, and I came to a roaring stop. The creature was lying in the bushes, breathing hard. Happy was sitting by it. I stood there for a moment, about ten feet away, and I suddenly felt terrible. It just looked at me, and its left shoulder was splattered with blood. I could see the pain in its eyes. It made no movement towards me, just watched me, while Happy licked off the blood. Oh God, I felt terrible. I had done this, and the creature had done nothing to me. I didn't know what to do. I suddenly wanted to help it. It looked young like maybe a teenager of the species would look. I knew I had to do something, but I was afraid to approach it. I was suddenly so angry that I took my rifle, emptied the chamber, and started beating it against a tree, splintering the stalk until it was useless. Then I threw it into the bushes. Then I started crying. The creature just watched me and did nothing. It was in pain. It occurred to me that maybe it was thirsty, I was wearing a felt cowboy type hat and there was a stream nearby, so I went down and filled the hat with water. I was afraid to go near the creature, but I did, showing it the water and it took the hat with one arm and drank spilling most of the water out. So I went down and got more and this time it, I held the hat while it drank, it began moaning. I knew the wound needed dressing, but I was afraid of it. What could I do? I decided I would try to help it anyways. I had caused this. I ran back to the house. There I got my little day pack and filled it with the stuff I would need to clean the wound, including my first aid kit. But how would I get the creature to lie still? It would be painful, and how would it know I wasn't just hurting it more and attack me? I got several bottles of wine from my wine cabinet. Maybe if it would drink the wine, it would help with the pain. I wished I had some hard liquor, but I'm not really much of a drinker. I grabbed a plastic pitcher from the kitchen. I ran back and believe me, I was pretty ramped up on adrenaline to even consider doing what I intended to do. I ran down to the little stream, put some water in the pitcher, then filled it with mostly wine. I hoped the diluted wine wouldn't be as noticeable to the creature and it would drink it. It was still thirsty and the plan worked. I did this several times and then waited. The creature had now had a full bottle of wine, not a lot for an animal its size, but hopefully it would help it with the pain. Sure enough, it seemed to kind of relax and not off a bit. Did I mention how much it stank? It really put me off, but I knew I had to help it anyways. But as I tried to get close enough to examine the wounds, it was really awful, the smell. But I worked through it and managed to kind of clean where the two bullets had gone into its shoulder. The blood had begun to clot and I put some neosporin on it, then bandaged it. The bullets hadn't been close enough to each other to create compound damage and it didn't look like they had hit anything but soft tissue. No bones, but it was hard to tell. But the real question was, were the bullets still in it or had they gone through? I needed to move the creature, turn it over to see what was going on. By now it was sleeping and was maybe even in shock. I wondered if the wine had been a good thing or not. I finally grabbed the creature's left arm and slowly and carefully turned it over enough to see where the wounds were. It was heavy. 
It looked like the bullets had gone on through, and I cleaned the wounds, put a bandage on them to keep them clean, then turned the guy back over. He stirred a bit, and I jumped. Then he slept. I didn't know what else I could do, so I went home. Happy chose to stay by the creature's side, which I was glad of, in case he needed protection. So I went home and sat down, or collapsed is more like it. I fell asleep in my chair. I think I was in shock. I woke up in the middle of the night worrying about the creature and Happy, so I got a light and went back out there, took some food for Happy, then I added in some stuff for the creature, a big ham I had. The creature was sitting up and he looked like he was feeling a bit better. I say he because I decided it had to be a male as it had no breasts. The rest is just conjecture. Happy was sitting by him and this creature was actually rubbing the dog's neck and I had thought that he was going to kill him. Once again, I felt like a total jerk. I was still very scared of him, but I decided to call him Hoss since he was so big, even as a youngster. So I called Happy over and gave him his dinner, which he was happy to get. I could tell that Hoss was interested, so I then offered him the ham. I carefully held it out to him. He took it with his big hand and ate it in just a couple of bites. I handed him some water in the pitcher and he drank it. His eyes were glazed over and I knew he was still in a lot of pain. So once again, I poured wine in with some water and offered it to him and he drank it. I don't remember much after that except waking up in the morning. I'd gone to sleep in the woods with Happy and Hoss. Hoss was again moaning and I knew I needed to do something besides giving him wine all the time. I tried to tell him I'd be back by motioning with my hands, then I went home. I drank some coffee. I still couldn't eat. Then I found some medicine I'd had from when my previous dog was sick. Tremadol, a morphine-like painkiller. I had quite a bit of it as he'd been on it for a fine degradation problem that was ongoing. I got some more food and went back out. I fed Happy again, then offered Haas some steak from my freezer. Not even thought out yet. He ate it, although he seemed to act like he wondered what the heck. He knew it was meat, but he never had a meat sickle. I then offered him some raw hamburger I had in the fridge, but I would put Tremadol into it, having extrapolated how much by guessing his weight. It took a good bit. He ate it, and it wasn't too long before I could see him relax. I wanted to, again, clean the wounds and put fresh bandages on, and I hoped he'd let me. He actually did, like he knew what I was doing, and even moved around a bit so I could get to his back. I cleaned up his wounds, the bleeding had now stopped, and they looked to be better. But now I remembered that any time my dog had a wound, the vet had used antibiotics. I began to worry about infection. How in the heck was I going to get antibiotics for Haas? Just tell the doctor I was treating a Bigfoot? Yes. By now, I had decided Haas must be a young Bigfoot. And now you understand why I don't tell this story to just anyone. They would have had me committed. I was exhausted, so I went home. I hadn't been home 10 minutes when I thought about Haas being out there in the sun needing water, so I went back out with my patio umbrella and a bucket. I got this all set up, left a big bucket of water, and went home again. I was glad I was a teacher and on summer vacation and didn't have anything else going on. I lay down to take a little nap but couldn't sleep. I think this is when the fantasy nature of everything hit me. I began to wonder if I'd gone mad. I got up and paced around. I needed to talk to someone, but who? Everyone would think I was totally insane. Yep, you shot a Bigfoot and now you're out there nursing it. And you and this big white dog, I lay back down and finally went to sleep. This went on for days. Me taking food out and nursing the wounds, Happy stayed with Hoss the entire time. I worried about what would happen if someone found out, but... The forests here are so thick and this is really off the beaten path and fortunately that didn't happen. Slowly Hoss began to improve and it really wasn't long before he was up and about but unable to use his arm to hunt or whatever he did for food. So I would continue to bring him new stuff. He was beginning to eat me out of house and home but I didn't mind. I brought him all kinds of food, but he liked meat and berries the best, which made sense, I guess. Maybe he ate kind of like a bear or something. Lots of berries and plant matter and meat when it was available. I have no idea what Bigfoot eat when they're on their own. But it wasn't long before he was getting his own water and all that, but still, his left arm was hanging like it was paralyzed or something. That really worried me. How in the world could I adopt a handicapped Bigfoot? But at least the wounds never got infected and they healed nicely. 
We'd been into this for weeks, but I could see that he finally let... We'd been into this for weeks now, but I could see that finally his left arm was beginning to regain movement, and eventually he seemed to be able to use it. Finally, Happy began coming back home with me, and Hoss often wouldn't be there when I came out to feed him. I would leave the food, and it would be gone the next day. One day, after I'd been out there several days in a row and the food hadn't been taken, I stopped feeding him. I knew he was gone. The very few trusted people I've told this story to always asked me about my relationship with Hoth. Did he learn to communicate with me? Did he seem to hate me or to appreciate my care? In short, Hoth seemed to just take whatever I offered and never showed anything much like we call emotion. As I became less afraid of him, I began to realize that he had been just as afraid of me. We both developed a mutual respect, and I think when I destroyed the gun, he knew what I was doing, and it let him know I meant him no further harm. No, we had no communications other than I did see him clap his hands a number of times when he saw me after his arm had healed, like, oh boy, dinner. He did seem to have a sort of goofy smile where he kind of bared his teeth like a chimp would do. At first it scared me, then I realized what it was and would smile back at him. He had big square teeth, like humans, only bigger, and no canines. But other than that, it was much like two humans who just couldn't talk to one another and just did the business they needed to do. What really got to me, though, was watching how he and Happy interacted, just like a boy and his dog. Once, about three months after I quit feeding Hoss, we were out on the porch and Happy took off wagging his tail. I knew he'd seen Hoss and I wondered if he'd come back. I half hoped Hoss would show himself, but he didn't. Happy came back a few hours later, stinking to high heaven, but I never saw anything like that again. It seems that Hoss left after that maybe he was saying goodbye to Happy. I don't know. Maybe he reunited with his parents. They probably thought he was telling a tall tale when he told his side of the story. I know I still haven't really processed all this, even ten years later, and probably never will. I still often wonder if I didn't hallucinate the entire thing, but I know it was real. Hallucinations don't go on for weeks, and something sure cleaned out my freezer. If Happy could talk, I know he'd vouch for my sanity. On to the next story. I'm 43 years old and live in Las Vegas. This story happened to me five years ago. I'd be glad to take a lie detector test if anyone doesn't believe me, but I don't suppose anyone will take me up on it. I do know how strange the story is, but it's true. It was in Northern California that all this happened, not far from the Trinity Alps. I've since found out there are a lot of Bigfoot accounts from there. My ex-husband and I had just split up. It was a nasty divorce. I had been suspecting he was losing his grip on reality for years, and things kept deteriorating. I'd rather not get into it, but I ended up letting him have the house just because I didn't want to fight him. I was afraid of him. I just wanted to get away at that point. So... I had given my husband the house, and I was renting a small apartment. I got a call from a mutual friend of ours telling me my ex had gone to the police and filed a report accusing me of identity theft. Apparently, he'd maxed out his credit cards and was going to use this as a way of getting out of paying them, plus get back at me. Like I said, he wasn't doing very well at the time using his faculties. He's since been institutionalized for other things he's done, like threatening to kill his boss. I eventually got the house back and sold it, so I'll add right here that things have worked out okay for me. There were no charges filed against me. I've since moved from the area. But after I got that call, I had no idea what would happen, and I was scared of him. He could say or do anything. The police might believe him, and it could take a long time to vindicate me, and I didn't want to spend any time in jail. I've never been in trouble, so I didn't understand how it all worked that I could get an attorney and fight it. I just thought I'd be sent to jail. I guess I was a bit naive. My job was only part-time, so I decided to let the apartment go, put my stuff in storage, and hit the road for a bit until things settled down. I hadn't been served with any papers from the police, so I wasn't bailing on anything. I just knew what my ex was up to. It was just a few weeks later that I found myself camped near the Trinity Alps. I bought a small tent, a camp chair, a Coleman stove, and everything I needed to camp out. 
I was kind of enjoying it as it was the first time in years I had any downtime and I'd really been through a rough time with my ex. I needed a break. I had forgotten how consoling nature could be. I was in a small campground out in the middle of nowhere and there were almost no other campers. A few people would come for a day or two then leave. I usually had the place to myself. I had been there only one week and I knew I would probably have to leave in about a week and find another place since the rules said two weeks as it was public land but I was enjoying it and had intended to stay there as long as I could. No one I knew had any idea where I was. The first few nights were a bit scary, I'll admit, and every little noise would kind of make me worry. I was afraid of bears, mostly, but I had bear spray with me. I wasn't armed, and I will add that I will never camp again without being armed, but I'll just never camp again, period. As I got used to the night sounds, I got more comfortable with being out there and began to really enjoy it, and when people were in camp, it's doubtful they knew I was alone as I was camped in a spot where you really couldn't see anything but my car. The tent was hidden in the trees. On about the eighth night, things began to happen. At first, I could hear sounds that were new to me, the first being the sound of a baby crying far off in the trees, and that sound turned into more of a wailing. That really freaked me out, but I decided it had to be a mountain lion. It wasn't anywhere close by, and I knew cougars are afraid of people unless they're habituated like in rural areas with houses in their habitat. So I settled down a bit and was a bit wary, but was okay and went to sleep. Nothing else happened that night. The next night, I could hear what seemed to be some kind of big animal sighing. It sounded really big, but it wasn't close by. It would just go, huh. <sighs> like you would when you were trying to get someone's attention without actually saying something. I got my bear spray ready, but nothing happened. The next morning, I contemplated leaving, but it was such a pretty place, and I didn't know where to go, so I stayed. Things didn't seem so scary by daylight. The third night, I could hear what sounded like someone hitting a tree with a big stick. Whack, 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 three times in a row. Not long after that, I heard the same thing, but in a different direction and further away. This went on for a few minutes, and I admit, I got up and sat in my car, trying to figure it out. I finally decided it must be a deer whacking their antlers on trees. I finally got out of the car and went to bed. Then, sometime deep in the night, I woke to what sounded like pebbles being thrown into my tent. I was scared to death, but managed to get out my flashlight and shine it around from the inside, tent flap. I was too scared to get out. I thought I heard someone running away. I decided it was a raccoon that had been in the trees, knocking sticks into my tent. It's funny how when you don't know about certain things, you can figure out ways to explain away the deeds they do and the sounds they make. It'll become clearer what I'm talking about in a minute. I lay there and finally went back to sleep. You can imagine how fast I jolted awake when I woke up to feel my tent with me in it being pulled, scooted actually, across the ground. I screamed, and whatever it was let go of the tent and took off. I could hear the sound of something large running through the trees, and it sounded like it was on two feet. I was petrified with fear, but I finally got up the courage to get out of the tent, and I jumped in my car. Whatever it was had hands. No bear could have pulled my tent like that, and it was very strong, as I weighed about 150 pounds at the time. It pulled everything up like it weighed nothing, and I had the tent staked down. I knew it was time to leave, but... I realized I'd left my keys in the tent. I was too scared to get out and get them, but I knew I had to. I jumped from the car, crawled into the tent, grabbed my keys and pocketbook and jacket, and jumped back into the car. I left all my camp gear. It was then I saw a pair of eyes glowing in the dark, a greenish color, right on the other side of my tent, a good eight feet off the ground. I fumbled for a minute, then started up the car and tried to accelerate out, but it didn't move. I was panicky. Why wouldn't the car go? Then I realized there was something behind me. I could make out a dark silhouette in the rearview mirror. There was more than one of these things, whatever they were. 
Just then, the car began rocking up and down, up and down, like something heavy was jumping on the bumper. I panicked and really stepped on the gas, and whatever it was must have let go because I spun out, throwing rocks into the air, nearly losing control of the car, rocketing forward, and almost hitting a tree. I was now headed down a little road out of the campground as fast as I could go. I finally got out onto the country road and started picking up speed when I noticed something coming up next to the car running beside me. Even though it was dark, I could make it out and it scared the crap out of me. It was so big and massive, it had shoulders a good four feet wide and a huge head and it was dark in color. What really scared me was that it was keeping up with me even though I was now going fast. How fast? I don't even know. I was too scared to look at anything but where I was going, but I know it felt like a good 30 miles per hour, or even a bit more, which was fast given that I was on a rough dirt road. Now, there was another one on the other side of the car. I felt like I was having a nightmare. This couldn't be happening. The one next to me started slapping the car window like it was trying to break it or else make me panic so I would wreck. I stepped on the gas even more. I was going way too fast for a rough dirt road in the mountains in the dark, but I didn't care. I came to a curb and skid around it, nearly running over the one on the other side of me, and that's when I lost them. I drove and drove and drove. I drove until I was nearly out of gas, then stopped behind a grocery store and got out of my pajamas and into some regular clothes. I got gas, then drove some more. I didn't really stop for a good 10 hours, and by then I was exhausted, so I got a motel. I didn't even really know where I was going, and I couldn't eat. I couldn't rest, and I couldn't sleep. The next morning, I stopped at a store and bought some new clothes and threw away the old ones, including the pajamas I'd been wearing, trying to get rid of anything that would remind me of that night. I drove some more and got a different motel in another town, but I still couldn't sleep until it was dawn the next day. Then I just collapsed and didn't wake up until the maid kept pounding on the door. I finally figured out where I was, and I wasn't that far from my old hometown, back in Idaho. I guess my instincts had taken me there, even though my mind was pretty much gone. I barely even remember anything about those days on the road. I went on into town and found a cheap apartment I knew I would have a lot of thinking to do. It was literally weeks before I was able to go out and drive around town, much like before, I felt like I was getting kind of back to normal. I finally looked up a couple of old friends, and even though I never told them my story, I did tell them about the divorce, and they helped me a lot, thinking that it was the source of my trauma. I eventually went to a shrink, but they refused to believe that the night was real, and tried to treat me for hallucinations. So I quit that. I'm pretty much okay now, but I refuse to go out into the woods, ever. I moved to Las Vegas, as far from the forested country as I could find. Here in the middle of the desert, I will never set foot in the woods again, or camp for that matter. As far as that night goes, I know it was real, and I can show you the deep marks all along the driver's side of my car, like something with very hard nails had scratched it. I'm going to keep that car forever, so I'll always know I wasn't crazy that night, and something real happened to me. On to the next story. My wife and I are amateur naturalists with our home being filled with books and artifacts from years spent hiking in the woods. We have pressed leaf and fern collections, castings from wolves and other animal tracks, and all kinds of other oddities collected during our many excursions throughout the years. We have handmade lamps made from tree limbs that we gathered in the forests, and some of our furnishings were handcrafted by artisans from the forest to our north. I only mention this so that you can kind of get a feel for the type of people we are. At the time of this sighting, our two children were 9 and 12 years old, with Sophia being the oldest and Eddie was our youngest. At least twice a year, we would all go camping, but we spent many other days hiking and scavenging a variety of locations together. One of our favorite locations is the Helen Bar Lookout Trail in Mississauga Provincial Park. It's not too far from Toronto, and it is an absolutely exceptional place to hike and camp, having been there more than a dozen times before. The trail takes a few hours to traverse, 
So we generally bring a picnic lunch along to eat. Once we reach the midway point, typically in an area known as the Second Lookout, which is close to a lake named Helen Bar. There are many animals in this region, including deer, moose, and wolves. And it is not uncommon to see wolf tracks on this trail, because it's also used by the pack at times. In fact, this is where we had taken the casts which we have at home. Many people are afraid of wolves, but this is an unfounded fear. They are actually quite shy and have extremely keen senses of both smell and sight. The only indication of the wolf's presence that most people will ever experience is their howling, which we've heard on many occasions. This time, we had decided to travel in September. October and September are the rut seasons for moose, and we were hoping to stay out of harm's way and actually see a moose on this outing, which is easier said than done. As large as they are, it's extremely rare to see one here. I will do my best to give you a good idea of what we were seeing and what you would see if you were there with us. The trail is a large oblong hoop, which heads out towards Helen Bar Lake, then swings back around, with the return leg along the side of Semi-White Lake. These are two entirely different bodies of water, with Helen Bar being very shallow and Semi-White being deeper. Semi-White is home to lake trout, whitefish, and a lot of minnows, most of which like deeper water, while the other hand, Helen Bar is less than 15 feet at its deepest point, but it does support a robust population of brook trout. As you enter the trail, you get a real sense that you are leaving the world as you know it, like entering Middle Earth or some other fantasy forest. As you begin to move uphill, there are many boulders that were left behind by the glaciers. They are referred to as conglomerate rock or glaciers erratics. One of these rocks, which had more than likely had been dragged hundreds of miles by the ice, is of immense size and proportion. There is also quite a lot of ferns growing both on and around this huge boulder. Passing the boulder field, you start to enter into the heart of an upland forest, an area filled with red oak, yellow birch, and sugar maples. All of these trees are at the extreme northern limits of where they can grow and thrive. Directly alongside them, you begin to see what is known as the northern boreal forest, where spruce and balsam firs take over. While on the trail, you walk at the very cusp of the transition zone between the two different forests and as you continue your hike you also begin to see many stumps which are remnants of the logging for white pine which occurred here years ago as you continue along the route you will see a large swath cut from the forest which was done intentionally by the province of ontario the young growth which springs up in these area provides reachable and edible food for the deer population as you approach what is known as the first lookout, you are confronted by steep rock faces, which stand in stark contrast to the beautiful forest that surround them. From both the first and second lookout, you can see the shallow and lovely Lake Helen Bar. Between the two lookouts, there are many large trees which have been uprooted by the wind, leaving their enormous root balls exposed. On this day, we began our descent from the second lookout and walked about a quarter of a mile passing many of these fallen trees when just up ahead of us, a large bull moose emerged from the forest, more than likely after a trip to Lake Semiwhite, which is one of their favorite feeding zones. They love the aquatic plants that grow in the shallows at the lake's edges. He was right on our path making mating calls. As he lumbered along, and we didn't want to get too close, so we started to backtrack. As we did, we snapped some pictures and tried to enjoy the moment while remaining cautious. He seemed as though he was not going to move on anytime soon, so we decided to back up near the area of the fallen trees and hang out for a while since our only other alternative was to hike all the way back the way we'd come. As we were waiting, Sophia told me that she had seen something come out from behind a tree. There were quite a few dead trees, so I asked her which one, and she pointed at a large root ball maybe 150 feet away from us. 
As we all stood there, focusing on the giant root ball, my eyes were drawn to a large, black, furry arm that was wrapped through and around some of the old roots, extending from the side of the root ball. No sooner had I begun focusing on it than a large head jutted out from behind the ball, looking right at us. Almost simultaneously, my daughter and wife said, Oh my God, look at that. The head started twitching back and forth in a crazy manner, moving back and forth incredibly fast, and the arm was pulled back out of view. My daughter told me, that she was scared, and both children moved closer to us. I reached down to grab a large piece of branch, breaking it off into a club, and as I did so, this thing took off at a frantic pace, running through the trees. It moved so quickly that it was almost a blur, and we could hear it crashing and thrashing through the trees as it ran. We were absolutely in shock, and my daughter was so frightened that she was in tears. After a long minute, we started to walk back to where the moose had been, looking back over our shoulders the entire time. Thankfully, we reached the area again. The bull moose had moved on. About 45 minutes later, we were back at camp and safe. Though brief, we had a good enough look at the creature that I can describe it in detail. I would estimate that its arm was over 5 feet in length and heavily covered in what seemed to be thick, blackish-brown fur. When its head moved into view, we could see a portion of its body through the root ball of the down tree, and it looked like a big gorilla. But of course, we all know that there are no gorillas present here or anywhere else in the States. Even if one fell to the earth here, it would never survive the climate. This was a Bigfoot. The head had longer hair than on the rest of the body, and when it started flipping its head left and right, we could see the long hair flipping back and forth. It looked like a lead guitarist in the middle of some mad jam session performing this twitching motion so fast. That was hard to comprehend why it would do so, but it was. When it ran into the woods, it led with its arms and its hands, plowing everything out of its way, like it was a whirlwind of activity as it parted the brush and pushed forward through the undergrowth, slapping saplings and brush aside with seemingly no regard for getting hurt. We could clearly see when it moved out of the covered roots that everything about his body was tall, well-formed, and muscular. The biceps and forearms looked like tree limbs, and from front to back, its upper thighs must have been 16 inches deep, but its butt cheeks stuck out well beyond the thickness of its thighs. It was completely different from a human's buttocks. Its hands and feet were extremely long, and when it feet were lifted as it stepped, I noticed that their bottoms looked like leather shoe sole with fur coming down the edges. At no time did it show its teeth, and when it disappeared, we could faintly hear it thrashing away for the fair amount of time before everything went silent, of course. We don't know if it had broken into a clearing or if it was just too far away for us to hear it, but at that point, the encounter was over. On to the next story. In retirement, my Uncle Jack moved to Rutland County in Vermont, having been employed as a graphic artist for most of his life. He also dabbled in watercolor paintings as a hobby for an equally long period of time. Being a city boy for most of his life, he would head to the country whenever possible in search of some interesting subject matter to paint, which was his favorite theme being fly fishermen, covered bridges, and old farmhouses and boats. He not only painted fly fishermen, but was totally taken to the hobby himself. I would go visit him periodically in order to fly fish with him, and without the immediate surroundings of his area alone, there were many great places to fish for brook trout. It was a veritable potpourri of fly fishing pleasure. On this day, we headed to a place where we had fished several times in the past, it being my uncle's favorite spot to fish, with very good reason. Not only was the fishing superb, but this location was some of the most beautiful Vermont property that you will ever set eyes on. While I fished on the rocky bank of the creek several years before, he had been on the other side of the creek with an easel using me as a model for a painting and I have this painting in my home to this very day. We were near a town called Wallingford, and were fishing a body of water known as Otter Creek. 
He knew a gentleman who owned an old farmstead that this creek passed through, and it was a combination of the man's property and outbuilding in conjunction with the shape and natural design of the creek in the area, which made it such an outstanding location. I will do my best to bring you into this picture. The original owners of the farm had been cheesemakers and created what we now know as Vermont Cheddar. I would say that the acreage was about 40, give or take a few, and there was a large farmhouse that sat in the middle of the land, as well as two very large, unpainted, and well-weathered barns. When you looked out over the farm from the elevation of the house, it was mostly cleared, rolling terraced land. Aside from a few trees that had been left for shade and aesthetic, it was comprised of a number of large sections which were separated from each other, with split rail fences and gates. This allowed the cows to graze in certain areas while allowing the rest to grow back. This terraced land rolled down to the edge of the creek where we were standing, with the creek itself being maybe 40 feet wide at this point, including its rock-strewn banks. Now, if you were to stand on the western side of the creek, your back would be to the farm, and if you crossed over to the eastern side, your back was now against the steep embankment that had trees of many shapes and sizes growing on it. The creek had grayish-colored, sharply angled stones on both of its banks, as well as within it. Some weighed hundreds of pounds, and most of the larger stones within the river had fish hiding behind them. For the most part, the creek was about a foot deep, but there were also some smaller, deeper pools. The day was very overcast and gray, which I prefer over bright sunlight for fishing, so for me, it was perfect. There was not another soul in sight, as we had permission to be there by the owner, and he was away on a Christian mercy mission in South America. Since he was a doctor by trade, he and a medical team occasionally donated their skills and time to help others, who are less fortunate than the rest of us, and so we were alone and tuckered down into this creek. For those of you who don't fish, there are times when fishermen laugh and joke around, but most of the time is spent in silence and solitude. We had been quietly working the creek for two to three hours when we heard a large splash on the water that came from somewhere around the bend. I saw my uncle look in the direction of the splash, but we kept on fishing. Moments later, we heard a couple more splashes in quick succession as we quietly began to move together towards the sound, exchanging a couple of quiet words and wondering what might have made the noise. A splash always gets the utmost attention from a fisherman. It doesn't matter if you are in the bay, ocean, lake, river, or creek. A fisherman always wants to know what's splashing and why. So the two of us began to stealthily creep along the bank. We were both hunched over, trying to catch a first glimpse under some tree branches. All of a sudden, I saw a long, dark arm reach down and hit the water with a splash, and my uncle reeled backwards and almost fell. He turned and mouthed to me, It's a damn Bigfoot, and waved for me to move back. We must have retreated about a hundred yards away, moving to a point far beyond where we had begun, and for additional protection, we crossed to the other side of the creek and climbed up the farm's first grassy berm to a point where we were about 15 feet or so above the creek. Slowly, we started to make our way over to a place where we could see the creature, doing our utmost to use some bushes and small trees as cover. Finally, we reached a favorable position and hunkered down to observe its movements. We were further away, but we could see even more now that we had seen from the creek. The Bigfoot must have been so preoccupied with trying to grab trout that it didn't stand a chance of noticing us. He was bent over, staring at the water without taking so much a single break to look away. We watched him try to grab a trout at least 20 times without success, but he just kept trying. This thing was determined. Now, just in case you don't know, trout are extremely slimy, and that slime acts as a protective coating. It's generally only after a good fight that you are able to cradle them very gently in your hands and take the hook out of their mouth. No matter who or what you are, the act of grabbing one while it's swimming is nearly impossible, hence the creature's obvious frustration. We must have watched for 45 minutes, and it still hadn't had any success in catching a trout. Finally, it looked up, 
surveyed the area briefly, and turned, climbing up the steep bank in three steps, and having reached the top, walking out of our sight. It was absolutely out of this world. It was only once the thing was out of our sight that we began to talk quietly. When I had initially seen the arm come into view, I thought it had to be five feet long. It turns out that my uncle had seen the head and upper body at the same time I had seen the extended arm, so he knew what the thing was before I did. Its hair had some rusty colored undertones to it, and I think that if the sun was shining, we would have been able to see even more of the reddish hues. The hair was actually very long on some areas of its body, in particular the head. I would say that it was 10 inches longer or so in length. It hung off the back of its arms as well. The head was somewhat conical, but not pointy, and the upper part of the skull stood out so much prouder than ours. Its face was much flatter, and the jaw protruded well beyond its nose. Its facial skin was also very dark and deeply furrowed. In fact, the wrinkles were so deep that they appeared as painted black lines on the face and the brow of the creature. I would estimate its weight at about 1,500 pounds. This beast's back was five times as thick as those of the most massive weightlifters that you have ever seen in your life. I would venture to say that it could probably snap a baseball bat in half with just its fingers. When we had briefly caught a back view of the creature, it appeared to me that its triceps were maybe 12 inches wide and perhaps even more than that. Now, try standing in front of a mirror while holding a ruler next to your arm and visualize what I'm saying. When we saw it take three steps up the embankment, its legs were obviously flexed to the maximum, with the thigh muscles having bulged to a point where they looked to be two feet thick. The body strength that would be needed to make this motion so quickly and without grabbing so much as a branch would be off the charts in the human realm. But this thing is in no way a human being, nor is it our mutated offspring. This is some kind of animal. I remember seeing a film clip of a grizzly bear running down a deer on a mountain slope. This grizzly was booking it and then its musculature was all business. When I watched the deer get spooked and run on my own property, it is incomprehensible that anything else could catch it and yet this 1500 pound grizzly had the wherewithal to do so. It was all so real yet so unreal at the same time. I know you get it, but when you are there, seeing it with your own two eyes, it is only then that the legend can truly ring true and become part of your reality. On to the next story. I think this may be one of the more unusual ways to meet a future spouse. Meeting someone in a tourist parking lot isn't that unusual in itself, but the event that triggered us talking to one another was quite unusual. So much so that when people ask how Joni and I met, we just say in a parking lot and let it go at that. I'm Tim. And when all this happened, I was in my early 30s and still not married, as I put my career as an ER doctor on the front burner and never had time for my relationship. I did have a few short-term affairs, but women quickly got tired of my lifestyle and called me a workaholic, saying I was married to my job. In a way, it was true, as I always wanted to be a doctor, but coming from a humble background, I had to earn every minute of it. I finally achieved my goal at a fairly young age, and I could actually say I loved my job, though it could be stressful. I would decompress by reading travel blogs and looking at maps and planning my own dream trip of a lifetime to drive the Alcan Highway, now called the Alaskan Highway. The highway itself technically starts at Dawson Creek, BC, but for me, the trip really began when I crossed the Canadian border. That was all new territory for me, as I'd never been through there before. I was such a greenhorn traveler that I was nervous crossing the border station in Washington, and I recall wishing I had a cigarette. I had smoked for about two weeks as a college freshman and quickly realized how self-destructive it was and quit. Can you imagine an ER doctor wanting a cigarette after all the smoking-induced trauma and diseases we deal with? Okay, I'm getting totally off track here, which I have a tendency to do. Sometimes I'll start trying to educate the patient on their problem and will end up having a nice conversation on just about anything else. 
My patients say, I have a nice bedside manner, but I'm really just interested in people and their lives. I'm still off track, so back to Joni, the love of my life. I had bought a nice Ford pickup and put a used camper on it as everyone said that was the best way to travel to Alaska. You had your bed with you so you could stop anywhere you wanted, which was good as a lot of the long road up there is fairly remote and lacking in anemones, and I don't like motels anyways. I crossed the border at Creston and headed over to Invermere as I wanted to see the famous Canadian Rockies on my trip up. I would go to Radium Hot Springs and camp near Kootenai National Park, then go see Lake Louise and all the famous places near Banff, then head up the famous Icefield Parkways to Jasper. I knew this portion of the trip would be very crowded with tourists, but I was willing to deal with this to be able to see some of the most stunning mountains in the world. Living in Seattle at the time, I'd spent plenty of time in the Cascades in Washington, and they're truly unique and beautiful, but there's something about the size of the Canadian Rockies that takes your breath away. They're not that tall in comparison to other mountains like the Colorado Rockies, but they start lower in elevation so you get more sheer height, and their sedimentary layers make for some really interesting topography. I camped at Invermere, a nice town by a big lake, then drove onto Radium, Hot Springs, turned east. Wow, was I in heaven the minute I entered Kootenai National Park. This with its glacial blue and green rivers. I then traveled on to the sites around Banff. I could go on and on here, but you just need to see it to understand. So, on with the story. I'd spent several days in the area that had finally started up the Icefield Parkway, which goes through both Banff and Jasper National Park. Now, Canada has national parks just like the U.S., but it also has a ton of provincial parks. I'm not really sure what the difference is, as some provincial parks are as epic as the national parks, and you can usually camp in both. Maybe it's the way they're managed and used, but I'm getting sidetracked again. The Icefield Parkway is a smooth four-lane highway that cuts right through the Rockies from Lake Louise to Jasper, a distance of about 140 miles. It goes through a long valley for miles, following a beautiful, wide but shallow glacial river that's a pale milky blue that eventually climbs to the Columbia Glacial Field, and thus its name, the Icefield Parkway. At one place, you're just across the road from the at the Baskin Glacier, which appears to be hundreds of feet thick. There's a big tourist center there where you can buy tickets to go out on the glacier in these giant snowcats. The glacier is quite a sight, and you can also hike out on it, though there are signs everywhere saying how dangerous it is. On down the road, just away from the big glacier center, is a pull-off, and I stopped there to get some photos. This lookout is right across from some huge cliffs coming off the mountain where the edge of the glacier hangs, and huge waterfalls drop down from the glacial melt. By huge, I mean the size of ones you see in Yosemite, and there are about half a dozen coming off the cliffs, some some on a second band of rocks beneath the first. The falls are far enough away that you need binoculars to really see them well, so I got out my high-powered glasses and leaned against the front of my truck and started scanning the cliff bands. My gosh, that glacier is thick. It looks to be at least a hundred feet, and you could see far above its terminal edge, where it hung down the mountain. That in itself was pretty dramatic, but the falls were beyond spectacular. I could imagine the roar they must have made if one was closer. It was a very dramatic scene. I love stuff like this, the forces and power of nature, and I was so enthralled that I didn't even notice when a small car pulled up next to me. I did notice a very pretty woman getting out of the car, but I was soon back to my binoculars. Finally, she asked me what I was looking at. You could see these distant falls, only if someone pointed them out to you, as they blended into the snowy cliffs from a distance. I handed her my binoculars, and she was just as spellbound as I had been. While she was viewing the scene, I noticed a black spot moving on the glacier above the falls. I told her to check it out. It had to be a rock slowly slipping down the glacier, but it was hard to figure out the mechanics of this. 
as a rock would be stuck in the snow and ice not moving. Plus, then I realized it was going more sideways. It looks like a big grizzly bear, she replied, handing back the binoculars. I took a look and was amazed. It was indeed some kind of large bear, and it appeared to be trying to cross the glacier. It looked like it was far enough from the lip of the glacier that it was in no danger. What a day! To see a grizzly on a glacier in Canada? Not something you see every day back in Seattle, for sure. I handed the glasses back to this very pretty woman, and as she watched the bear, I began to watch her. She seemed very intelligent, though how I could tell is beyond me, and that to me was more important than looks in a partner because they were going to be the ones helping you get through life. But I swear, I wasn't consciously thinking about this. It was just on a subconscious level, but I knew I wanted her to stick around long enough to get to know her better. I noticed her plates were from BC, so I asked what part from the province she was from. She said she was from Victoria and was on vacation. I didn't want to pry. So I didn't ask any more questions, but I remember being happy that she lived fairly close to Seattle. I took the binoculars back, watching this bear, and it stood on its hind legs. I could now feel the hair on my arms stand straight up and a chill go down my back. The thing no longer looked like a bear. It, I handed her the glasses, wanting to see a reaction. Oh my god, she said. What is that thing? The few people I've told this story to all ask how we could see this thing from that distance, but let me tell you, these were very powerful Nikon binoculars with excellent resolution. I looked again, and I could see it had very long arms and was built like a linebacker. It now proceeded to walk upright across the glacier, and I held my breath, for it was getting closer to the lip. It's too close to the edge. Whatever it is, I said. It's a Sasquatch, she replied matter-of-factly. I ignored what she just said. To me, Bigfoot was a total myth, one I'd heard plenty about living in Washington. I thought the whole concept was silly, but what I was seeing really didn't look like a bear. What's it trying to do anyways, I asked. Probably just get across the glacier. But it acts like it's not really aware of how close it is to the edge, Joni replied. That glacier's so thick it could probably walk right on the edge and be okay, I surmised. The Sasquatch looks really heavy, Joni noted. What would you guess, I asked. Maybe 600 or 800 pounds? It's huge. We talk like this all the while, holding our breath while taking turns with the binoculars. Finally, I said, I'm Tim. I'm Joni, she replied. Nice to meet you. We watched the more, spellbound. Joni had the glasses and was watching when it happened. In retrospect, I'm glad I didn't see it, but I also wish she hadn't, as it really messed with her mind. In fact, she, in fact it still does, somewhat after 10 years. Joni gasped, and I could barely see what looked like a huge chunk of ice break from the glacier's lip. And as if, in slow motion, come tumbling down that sheer cliff, huge chunks of ice breaking off and flying through the air alongside the huge waterfalls. Now she was saying, oh no, oh no, her hands clutched onto those binoculars like a lifeline, and she kept saying, oh no, over and over. She stood, watching for the longest time, and when she finally handed the binoculars to me, I could see tears. I didn't have to ask. I knew the avalanche had taken the Sasquatch with it. I scanned the base of the cliffs where the chunks of ice had landed, but saw nothing but a rubble field of snow, with the waterfalls coming down onto it. I knew there was virtually no chance anything could have lived through such chaos. We both stood in silence. Had we really seen a Sasquatch, and not only that, but one fall to its death? What were the odds of that? I couldn't even imagine. I put my binoculars in their case and quietly asked Joni if she would mind sticking around long enough to describe to me in detail what she'd seen. I offered to make her a cup of tea, so we climbed into the back of my camper and sat at my little dinette drinking tea and talking. Looking out the window at the distant waterfalls, I never mentioned to Joni that I was a doctor, as it's been my experience that women who might not be at all interested in me suddenly are as they imagine a wealthy lifestyle. I'm far from wealthy, but I get by okay. Funny thing is, I never asked her about what she did. I didn't even ask if she was married. After a couple of hours of talking, we headed 
our separate ways on down the road, even though we were both headed to Jasper, we did exchange cell numbers. I got to Jasper a few hours later when my phone rang. I didn't recognize the number, and cell phone service in Canada is a couple of dollars a minute if you're on a U.S. plan, which I was, so I didn't answer. Whoever it was had left a message, so I finally got curious enough to listen to it. It was Joni. Would I like to meet her for dinner in Jasper at the Raven Bistro? She was staying at a friend's, and I could park my camper there for the night if I wanted. Jasper's a busy tourist town, and as beautiful as it is, it's not my cup of tea. I'd planned on keeping on going, but something said to have dinner. I needed to eat anyways, right? I was tired of soup, PB&J sandwiches. I called her back and met her at the restaurant, and all I can say was that it was all downhill from there. What I mean is, I never made it to Alaska, but I did come to explore the city of Victoria and its surrounding quite well, staying at Joni's house after we left Jasper. We did finally travel to Alaska, but years later. We were married a year later, and come to find out, Joni is also a doctor, a pediatrician. I moved to Victoria for a few years, then moved to the U.S., so we both got jobs in Kalispell, Montana, in a hospital there. We're close enough to her family in Victoria that we can visit when we want, and since most of my family lives in New Mexico, it's not that terribly far either. And what about the Sasquatch? Well, we beat that subject to death, talking about it and how we both read everything we could about them. Nothing can convince us what we saw that day up on the glacier was anything else. But what a unique way to meet your spouse, eh? I hope you enjoyed those stories. If you did, be sure to hit that like button and be sure to subscribe. I post new videos every Thursday, so if you hit that notification bell, you'll be notified when they go live. Again, thank you so much for watching this video, and until next time, bye!